Now, I'll admit, as a kid, I enjoyed elements of this film. I kind of had to. We didn't own too many movies. 20 years or so later, I decided to watch it again to see if anything had changed. Yes, it's notorious online. It has a 1% on Rotten Tomatoes. Dana Carvey is a funny guy. He's done some funny things, and he knows what works and what doesn't. And I figured, hey, it can't be that bad, right? Okay, I'm gonna forego the whole, oh wow, it's actually really bad, who would have guessed? Because obviously I've already written a script for this video beforehand. I know how it ends. I don't want to shit all over it because that's been done to death. So I'll give it the benefit of the doubt. Look at it in a positive light, or at least as positive as I can muster before I give up. So the film starts. We get the intro title and it goes on for a long ass time. This is pretty standard in your early 2000s films. And it's entirely possible that this was just a stylistic choice, but it could also be due to the length of the film. See, this movie is short. It's so short it doesn't technically count as a feature film. So you'll see odd choices like a 15 minute end credit sequence. That's not to say that there wasn't enough material here for a full film, but I'll get to that. Okay, 1970s, we got Brent Spiner. Yes, Data himself in his best performance yet. And he's chasing Bo Derek. Considering what Bo Derek is best known for, and considering this is the opening of the film, of a kid's movie. It's an odd choice, but I can roll with it. Turns out it's actually a disguise, and James Brolin is under the mask. He says, uh, I'm done being the master of disguise. And my son will, will not do this. So you see where the movie's going. It's modern day. We get the introduction to our hero, Dana Carvey, with a shaving cream beard and underwear on his head. Comedy fucking gold. We get a flashback of he's always tried to imitate people in his youth, and he's always been a wacky, wacky, wacky guy. You'll learn pretty quickly that they settled on slapstick as the default kind of humor for this film. Literally. Naturally, pistachio one to find a girl just like mama yeah that was that was weird a woman he just met recently says leave me alone quit calling me yes something about her reminds me of my mama let's just let's try to forget about that okay we meet this kid who is skateboarding and he crashes and dana's like i'll cheer him up with my funny voices why don't you get away from me donkey what you talk about get away from you? I'm making waffles. We meet the dog named the cuteness. It's, that's it. He doesn't really do a lot. It's a dog. Next we get to the restaurant. Pastrami is carrying all the foods and Biff shoves him and he spills all the food on the people. Oh no, oopsie. Gotta give some credit to these extras just sitting there and letting Dana Carvey do this to them. We get ourselves at what I imagine is a Texas man who demands man-sized meatballs. This sends Pastrumbo into sort of an ethereal state where he's forced to imitate the man. Am I going too fast for you? Hmm? One side note, they actually have the actors practice delivering lines beforehand in such a way that Dana Carvey could more easily mimic them. I guess it's common sense, but I don't know. It, it's something. I watched the DVD commentary. I want to make that experience worthwhile. Texas man gets upset. Papa comes and defends Dana Carvey from the Texas wrath. No, 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 my son. Your destiny is here, okay? Yes, destiny is here. But Papa don't preach. I'm in trouble deep, and I'm keeping my baby. You know what? Poncho finds a woman with Biff. She says, get lost. He just kind of stares at them, and then his family is kidnapped. I know my recap of all this sounds a bit brief, but then again, the movie is only 65 minutes. Everything happens pretty fast. Mario is distressed at this news. Hello, my name is Pistachio, and oh, Mama's cannoli is here. Don't call again. He goes into another psychic episode, but luckily we get the introduction of Harold Gould as the Grimp Papa. Pistache finds a maid cleaning, turns out it's his grandpapa in disguise, and then he just rubs, just rubs the poor actress's face. We get more exposition of historical disguises, the family line, and them doing things. The Abraham Lincoln scene was apparently put in by Happy Madison, and yeah, I can see that. We also get a pop-up book explaining the, the world and its various rules. It's a pop-up. 
<laughs> they go upstairs, they find a shaft, and this thing makes the windows, the blow, and the monkey go. Apparently the powers of the disguises are like a, a real tangible thing. It's called Energy Code. We get a montage of things, things for the trailer, things for things sake, all set to this original song by early 2000s musicians. We get the scene of Dana Carvey attracting young boys with his allure. Next scene we get Brent Spiner explaining the plan, the exposition of the film to Papa. He wants to steal the most valuable items on the planet and sell them. Papa's like, no, don't do it, you evil metal man. And Data laughs, <laughs> and then he... Okay, so this running gag, which is definitely the most infamous part of the movie, because it happens a lot, is one of those gags mandated by the studio. Apparently Dana Carvey hated the idea of shoving in fart jokes to the movie, and the compromise that was set was that, hey, we'll have a fart after a long laugh and a pause, and hopefully that awkward silence and the timing would make the joke slightly more complex. With that said, I guess it's better than just having Data shit himself on screen every few minutes, but still, it's not ideal. We follow up this excellent moment with the Indian scene. <laughs> Open the sesame! Open the sesame! And that, that right there, uh, how do I put this? That's bold. That's a bold move in a bold movie by a bold man. It's explained here that disguises can change their mind and become another person, garnering new skills and losing control. And he plays the recorder and it's a Kenny G song and there's a snake and it eats the cheese. There's a slapping dummy that slaps him. Uh, uh, uh. Apparently there is a guy inside that actually controlling the thing, both in the context of the movie and the actual prop itself. Look at him chasing the little fella over there. The first attempt to steal a valuable item is Michael Johnson being handed the Constitution. It's a disguise, Data shits himself. That's the scene. And it happens a few times in this movie, and it happens exactly like this. So I'll just go through all of them right here. You have Jesse Ventura gets the Liberty Bell, Data shits himself. Jessica Simpson gets the Apollo Lander, Data shits himself. It's like poetry. It rhymes. We get this scene, this gem of a scene. <laughs> Could be a good wife for you. Okay, if I sound dismayed at all, keep in mind, I've watched this movie like three times in the last week. I've seen this scene three times, once with director commentary. It, it, it weighs on you. We find out there's 7,000 levels of disguise mastery and, and old Patum 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 Go Pachumbo Plum Geep Bleep Blue He's at the bottom. This means he's qualified for an assistant. Cue montage. All the applicants don't get accepted. There's a song that plays, and then the kid from earlier crashes into the house. Okay, his mom appears. And yup, she's the primary love interest, right? Like, I'm not sure if this is intentionally a joke in the vein of incredibly attractive woman paired with comedian of less attractive looks, but this is probably the biggest disparity I could think of. Measurements? What for? For a uniform. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Um, is 35, 24, 34? <laughs> you said 34? <laughs> a little bottom. <laughs> I think the character Jennifer, she functions well as the outsider looking in on this world, and she plays it completely straight, and that does work. About the dental, when I get stuff done, or Barney gets stuff done, do, do I pay it and then you reimburse me, or do I bill Delta Dental directly? I'm just not sure how it works. You sick of me. Okay, so Grandpapa is gonna leave the movie, and it's up to Picard to save his family by himself and his assistants. I don't know why he leaves. After searching near the dumpster where the father was kidnapped, Jennifer finds a cigar label, and they decide to investigate the Turtle Club. Yes, this scene. It's quite infamous for many reasons. The marketing leaned pretty hard into the Turtle Man. The other infamous part is this also happened to be filmed on, uh, 
a, a specifically bad day in 2001. They find out Devlin Bowman is the name of the bad guy. I mean, I'm sorry, Data. Data's the bad guy. Then a bunch of guys just start making fun of him, and so he goes in his shell and he... <sighs> Yeah. Okay, so this whole biting the nose off thing, that wasn't originally supposed to be there. Even in the ads, it was supposed to be Turtle Man goes in a shell, then comes out and bites the cigar tips off the three guys. It's even in the deleted scenes and the trailer. But apparently Adam Sandler thought that... <sighs> Hey, wouldn't it be funny, and the kids would love it, if he got in a shell, and he popped out, and he bit the guy's nose off, and he spit it back on, and then spun in a circle? We get the romantic subplot scene. Lines of dialogue are said. Good night, my love cake. Love cake? What? You said love cake. But why would I call you love cake? Your hindquarters are hideously scrawny. Next day, we meet Jennifer's boyfriend, uh, Biff2. Now, he's outlandishly bad, and I actually enjoy that. Hey, Barn! Grind that curb, buddy! Yeah! Oh. I'm okay! I'm okay! <laughs> what a loser. Okay, so on classmates.com, we see Brent Spiner's senior quote. Oh, to become the world's greatest black marketeer and possess the rarest treasures on Earth, then store them in a secret underground lair! What? This guy is crazy! Do you hear this? Uh, this... Ouch. Okay, so Bowman might be going to a rare toy fair, so they go there, and we get, we get this. Oh. Well, you're a tall drink of water, and I just love moisture. There's definitely an element of improv here, and there's a lot of sex jokes in this movie. The 2000s was a really horny time for America, it seems. Don't be ashamed of your feelings. Your desires are perfectly normal, I assure you. What desires? Well, guess what, Backstreet Boy? This is one girl scout that isn't content to be the Malcolm in your middle. Jennifer is invited to date his birthday party or something, and we get another, the book, we get the book gag. I'm not sure why Walking on Sunshine is playing right here, and it's the second time it's appeared in the film. And we get the party scene, and this is another one that was cut down by a lot. You have the Al Pacino-esque character doing his, yeah. The dialogue he originally had went on for much, much longer, but it was cut for what I assume is maybe too much leading into the sex jokes. I mean, it, there's a lot. You had little wing, some dinos. Oh yeah. He gets caught and he runs away, and then the henchmen follow him into this Jaws parody. 29 kids go in the water. 22 kids come out of the water. The ice cream man, he takes the rest. He gets discovered, he turns into a pile of shit. We get another song, and... Uh, uh, uh. By this point in the film, it's just Dana Carvey in different disguises like every 30 seconds. That's the movie. Apparently, he was supposed to have a tiny mouse in his pocket in the original cut, but they didn't keep that. That's a shame. Then he turns into this guy. Uh, okay, you get the point. It's a lot, of, a lot of disguises. He's the master of disguise. They go back to the bar and they run to Biff 2 and the woman who reminds Pikachu of his mother. This Slapping time she comes. He beats up Biff too, and he says, who's your daddy? And he, we get the obligatory romantic scene. Words are said. Did I, the future mother of my babies? I mean. And then she's just kidnapped. We get his grandpapa in a big pre-recorded hologram, but he still interacts with people in real time. I hope that's the joke, but again, in this movie it's hard to tell. We learn that Data wants to sell these items on Black Mark eBay, and his plan is to crazy glue a mask of his face onto Papa and throw him off a cliff, faking his death. It's called the perfect crime. Ever heard of it? Suddenly, a cherry pie arrives, and it turns out to be Dana Carvey, and he runs around and he kills people. Pistachio gets caught, he fights ninjas. 
Yeah, so I guess originally this was just going to be basic henchmen, but the studio said that you can't have violence towards people unless their face is concealed for that PG rating. Another potential scene to be included here was, um, Data has a bunch of women come out and use their ass ray on Dana Carvey, and it immobilizes him. <laughs> This was included in the end credit scene, by the way. You, you can actually see this, just, just right there for the whole world. Okay, so he saves Jennifer, and the mother saves herself. We learn that Papa was brainwashed, and now he has the dark side of Energico. Whatever the fuck that means. They climb on the Apollo lander. Paraplegic falls off, pulls his Gummy, underwear out from his ass, and he puts it on his head. This ends the brainwashing of Papa, somehow, uh, and he just shakes the mask off, the crazy glued mask right off his face, and the day is saved. We get the whole ending of what happens after that in narration, but we get one more final scene. Again, this is a Happy Madison edition with Dana Carvey as W. Bush finding Brent Spiner and getting the Constitution back. He slaps him hard, he falls in a pool, then he, uh, he shits himself. And he dies. Who's your daddy? Okay, so after this, we do have that 15 minutes of end credits, which is complete with shots of unused scenes. And there's a lot. And it's probably the most bizarre credits I've seen for a film, especially one this short. Because it seems like a whole other movie is out there. And this is just a, a mishmash of what they had on the cutting room floor. I'll get to all that in a bit. As for the movie, how it stands, I think it's... It's not good. I would say maybe one out of a hundred jokes land, and you're not even sure if it's funny in the way they intended, or I don't get it. And so I had to ask, what happened here? So I guess we should start way back. For context, in the early 2000s, Dana Carvey was kind of getting out of Hollywood. Sure, he writes and he stars in this film, but even before he declined the late night spot, the Dana Carvey show, I mean, that's a whole other topic for another day. That came and that went, but he had kids and he didn't seem too interested in a heavy work schedule. In short, nobody really cared about this movie. He just made it because he wanted his kids to see him in a kid's movie. In pre-pre-production, there was three potential drafts. The first was a Mission Impossible spoof, and Carvey would be the disguise guy. The second idea was a film adaptation of the 70s sitcom The Partridge Family, with Dana's added charm. The final idea was the one that would become Master of Disguise, but it came with a few caveats. Traditionally, Dana Carvey's humor wasn't kid-friendly, and reeling all that in for a PG rating, well, that seems like it was pretty tough. Having the production team of Happy Madison on board and Sony, well, you're gonna get a lot of studio interference. Other elements were changed entirely. There was a whole storyline of finding out that the cuteness is not a real dog. It's actually Grandpapa in disguise, and he's been doing this for 23 years. There's another deleted scene that's an extended sequence in the mansion where there's all these hallways and Dana Carvey's in a different disguise every time they open the door. The original historical flashback sequence was also longer, and we would have a caveman getting eaten by a dinosaur. Why this wasn't included, I, I don't know. Probably the most confusing omission from the movie is the deleted scene of the Toy Man. Well, oh, I may or may not. I'm from the good city of Toydelphia, Funsylvania. <laughs> Population fun 152. <laughs> now, I genuinely think this would have been the best scene in the film if it was included, considering the character may or may not appears in the DVD menu. I assume this was a very late cut. This is the world's first giant yo yo. Look at that. Oh, oh. Whoops, the cadaver looks more like a no yo. <laughs> oh, isn't it fun? Stringy string string. <laughs> oh, there it is. Try it. <laughs> the original ending before the Happy Madison, you know did their thing was Pistachio would chase down Devlin Bowman as Captain America, throw his CGI shield, and it hits him, and he punches him, and he kills him. After that, the family is having good times, but begin to mourn the loss of the cuteness, because in this cut, he was revealed to be the grandpapa. So then they guilt him into just being a dog forever? 
No dog food. Yes, of course. <sighs> and that's the movie. At least the original movie. I'm not gonna say it's the best ending. I assume this was cut because they kill Data and because they have Grandpa turn into a dog. Clearly, this film wasn't a passion project for the crew. Dana just wanted a kid's movie for his kids, and the studio higher-ups wanted something else. No one really got hurt by this. It was a quick cash grab for the studio, and Dana wanted out of film anyway. But even with that all said, I don't think it's as bad as many many people make it out to be. Sure, there's terrible moments, but I think there's fine jokes here and there, layered deep below literal piles of shit.